All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. Today I'm joined by James Kelly, Dr. James Kelly, who is in Bend, Oregon. How are you doing, James? I'm doing fantastic, John, and thanks for having me here today. Absolutely. And James is the founder of QChange and the author of The Crucible's Gift, Five Lessons from Authentic Leaders Who Thrive in Adversity. And what we're going to talk about today is, is an interesting subject, is there's a lot of, obviously, virtual meetings have exploded in 2021 or 2020 and will continue to in 2021. And some people struggle with uh, making virtual meetings as interactive or as robust as possible. What we're going to talk about is how do you actually drive inclusion in virtual meetings using technology? Um, so, James, let's just start off like um, kind of explain what the issue is here and then let's dive into the solution. Yeah, well, thanks again. So it's a really interesting time. And as you noted, you know, meetings in, in online meetings or virtual meetings are going to exist. I mean, so many Fortune 500 companies have said we're moving to a hybrid model, yeah. which pretty much means it's here forever. Mm -hmm. And the big issue is that in our organization, our philosophy, our framework, we really believe that a leader is like a rock you throw in a pond. It's the ripple. And yeah. so if the leader shows up and, you're, and, and the leader is more like a skipping rock, they're creating more damage than the rock that creates a ripple throughout the organization. And so often when a leader shows up to a meeting, they're not really fully aware of their impact, how they show up, how they're discussing or at least incorporating points of view. So for us, the leader kind of is at the center of everything we do. Yeah, and, and I guess um, the part of it is that, uh, I mean, it's obviously self-awareness, but it's also the fact that particularly when you are delivering things virtually, how it's received at the other end is, is almost open to um, interpretation by every single person who's on there. So you have to take a little bit more control over it. Yeah, and that's 100% correct. But is it, to me, is, is it about control or is it about awareness? Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like which one begets the other in terms of that, that tension point. And I can hear my son slamming the door every 15 seconds right now. Sorry about the app for the audience. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry um, about it. And, and so when we think about the virtual meeting or any meeting in general, the lack of self-awareness is really the critical point of the puzzle because often for many of us in a development world or trying to develop or be better at whatever it is we do. And I hope we're all striving to be better at something, whether it's brushing our teeth or mm -hmm. tying our shoelaces, whatever it might be. Um, we're getting feedback to know that we're doing a good job with that, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. So uh, to kind of wrap that up in terms of your point, you know, showing up in a virtual setting is so much more than just flipping the on button on mm -hmm. your camera and a mic, you know, and I think that that's what people are struggling with. You know, there's a whole thing about perception. You know, I'm sure, John, if, if you're, I mean, if you're such a good human being, it comes across that way that like I am sitting in meetings and I actually find myself being narcissistic. Like I'm staring at myself and I'm like, okay, am I looking well? Am I responding well? And then I stop listening. And there's like this perpetual narcissism going on in my head. And I think I'm a giver, but I feel like a taker <laughs> in the moment. I, I love that because I do think it does. It's a funny thing is because if you're in a, a physical meeting, you often like you get wrapped up in the meeting, but also you don't, you don't have the image yeah. of yourself staring back at you unless yeah. you happen to be sitting in front of a mirror or something. Um, but which you're would correct, weird, you're, which no. would be a weird dynamic, you know, if you were kind of preening <laughs> yourself during the meeting. But I mean, it is, it is yeah. true. It is true that when you're on a virtual meeting that you can get some, you can get self-consumed. And I think to your point uh, about leaders, uh, obviously leaders want to come across in the best way possible. So, uh, you know, maybe they do get caught up in worrying too much about like, you know, how they're appearing and rather saying like, how is my message being received? Am I communicating it in, in different ways for different people? Because I think that's the tough thing is yeah. that, you know, when, especially when you're a leader, people receive information in different ways. So you have to kind of modify your message or figure out how to deliver it differently to different people or differently to a group of people at the same time. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting, I find this, you know, in the meetings that I'm in, again, you may be the exact same way, is that I think in person, I have never been more, I'm so much less aware of how my words are having impact. 
mm-hmm. where in a virtual setting, I literally just see this head <laughs> and I see if they're engaged or not. And so it's such a different mental exercise in terms of trying to draw out the inclusion, the voices in the room, um, because I think you're so much more, when you're not staring at yourself, right? But I think you're so much more aware of how your words are falling positively or negatively. Yeah, no, I, I, I 100% agree with you. And I think the, the, the crazy thing or the, the difficult thing about the, the virtual is that there is so much temp- distraction temptation out there, right? So we may be having a meeting and I may say, oh, this looks like there's a message on my phone. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to really not very obviously like check it when I think you're not going to see that I'm checking it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This direction. Oh, oh, it's out of screen yeah. now. Okay. Like. So, so as we were talking about is is actually the organization of the meeting and making sure that you consider these things. Because I think you touched on a very important point earlier is that a lot of people think virtual meetings is literally hitting the button and turning up. Um, They don't put the same level of preparation as they would even into a physical meeting. And I think that's where a lot of the problems stem from. Yeah, and I I was saying the idea of the organizational culture and and, and the norms that you are creating is what's really important. So if I'm a leader and I come into a meeting and I have no expectations, if you're gonna have your video on, if you're gonna be multitasking, well then when it's your turn to lead a meeting, whoever that might be, then, then you're gonna receive the same behavior that I, was, that I received as the leader. And so that dyadic relationship of not having expectations or having expectations has a huge impact on these virtual meetings. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems that people are having is they're not sure how to set those ground rules in a way that doesn't sound almost parental in some ways, right? Like, I don't want to be your parent and tell you not to turn off your camera and mm-hmm. not to be distracted because our expectations is you shouldn't be. But I think by making those ground rules early on in this, even now or moving forward, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, and I think that's important. And I think that's important for virtual working in general because I think where a lot of people get into trouble with it or struggle with it is not setting expectations and not just setting it's very easy for for me to say to you and everybody okay in my organization you're going to be virtual you're going to be online through these hours and i'm going to have all these expectations but but given the reality of life today i may have to modify this for your circumstances somebody else's circumstances but i think again it goes back to the lack of proactive planning and ex- expectation setting and then just allowing things to just unfold organically and you end up with a bit of a mess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is really a metaphor for my life at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things I always think about when I have these conversations though is what can you do? Yeah. Right? Besides setting expectations and creating the norms, you know, you know, one of the idea of this conversation you and I are having is about inclusion. And one of the best ways to create inclusion is by welcoming all the different voices in the meeting. So through questions, mm-hmm. right? And often as a leader, I, I, you know, I've witnessed it so many times where people just talk at their team yeah. or, or they ask the one person who always has an opinion or maybe a second person, but they leave the other three people out. And mm-hmm. what happens is that when you bring in the full voices in the room or in the meeting, it a, allows those who usually are quiet not to escape out, not to not do the work and not be present. But it also typically adds a ton of value to the end result in that meeting or whatever meeting that might be. And almost always, and the science is really clear on this, you almost always get to the best decision possible with all the voices in the room providing an opinion. Yeah, and I think that's a, and I think that's an incredibly important thing. So I think that I think in many ways when you're doing virtual meetings as a leader, you ought to you're leading it, but you're not you're not you're not, you don't have to be the center of it all, right? And part of the leading it, as you said, is to draw out all of the voices, not just the ones that you always can rely on, but the rest of them. Because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, like you say, you'll arrive at better decisions, etc. But people don't always stay quiet because they're shy or whatever. Or they're not, you know, sometimes they just, they do it because out of many, vast many reasons. But it's your, <laughs> I was going to start naming them, but... Um, <laughs> But I think it's up to you to, as you said, is to is to draw out people and make it a make it a collaborative experience. And then, if you to your point earlier, if you set if that becomes the norm, then people will be prepared with their input. Yeah, and this is what I think is amazing is that when you start creating those those norms, 
the level of engagement actually goes up when it's done in a healthy way. You know, if you and I, every time we got in a meeting, start yelling at each other, it's going to really disengage everybody that's in that yeah. meeting. However, if it's done in a constructive, healthy, proactive, and positive manner, the overwhelming impact, again, as I said at the beginning of this, it starts with the leader. So that ripple effect ends up kind of going across the organization. You know, in my, in my book that I wrote, I talk about this concept called micro moments to meaning. And, mm -hmm. and I'll just be really brief on it. But the idea is that, you know, my aim as an individual when I work with uh, my team and whomever, I say, I want to leave a conversation with that person smiling. Because chemically inside the brain, it actually creates right. a trigger and a marker, which leads that person much more likely having the next conversation being positive and healthy and fun as well. And so creating those micro moments in a meeting are equally as important for when those in your team members walk away, they're more likely to have that next positive interaction across the organization. Yeah, and again, I mean, that takes some skill because if you do, if you are engaging in, in a discussion and an exchange of ideas and you are looking for people's input, the chances are that some people's ideas are not going to make it through or are going to get, you know, shot down maybe, but in a good way, what I'm yeah. just saying is part of it. Or a bad so, way sometimes. Or, or, or a bad way. <laughs> yeah. um, but to your point then, if you can make sure that you you pay tribute to the process that got you to the answer and you pay tribute to all of the contributions to it and, and that and you lighten things up before it closes you have a, a, a far greater chance of what you're talking yeah. about happening than if you just close it and then half the people go away going yeah typical typical my yeah. idea didn't get through that <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um and I just do, I just do think that, uh, to your point, I just do think that in a virtual environment, if, if you just increase your awareness and, mm. and I guess it comes back to empathy too. It says, yeah. remember that everybody on that call is sitting somewhere. They may be sitting in an optimal setup. They may not be in an optimal setup. Um, you know, they may have other stuff going on. Just, I think even just realizing that will help you when you start, when you do your meetings. Yeah, I feel like in today's society, you know, whether it's in person or it's virtual or in a mm -hmm. hybrid mode, um, we all need a little bit more humility and grace in this world at this point. Um, I think there's a lot of aggression around what's, around what's right, not what, what's most important about doing right. So, you know, I have a motto with my kids and it's, it's really, it's all around, hey, don't be right, do right. When you find right. yourself having to argue to be right, you're really defeating the whole purpose about doing right. And... <laughs> yeah. You know, I think in corporate world, that is really important. Um, and it's one of our mottos inside our organization is that if you find yourself fighting about being right, then you're probably missing yeah. the larger point about doing right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. And it's like, it's kind of similar to the, you know, the, the marriage advice, you know, do you want to be happy or right? Yeah, <laughs> I start off the right mode, but it yeah, but you soon re yeah you soon realize that happiness yeah, yeah. comes from you know, the, taking yeah. the other the other road. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think that but I think that's a great point though is um, I because I think we all get very much caught up in in our own stuff and what's going yeah. on, and and we do lose sight of the big picture sometimes. And I think that's where I think obviously that's where silo thinking comes from, but that's where people feel like they're they're excluded or whatever because we do get caught up. And I think I think the role of the leader is absolutely to bring everything back, always try and raise everything back up to the big picture. Well and that again that goes back to this notion of inclusion, right? So mm -hmm. every human being, whether they want to admit it or not, is an eight year old child that wants to be heard. That's mm -hmm. it. And if people feel valued and heard, whether they're they're perspective is adopted or shelved that is a positive interaction so mm -hmm. it's really about being heard and validating their perspective and it's really about saying yeah i love it it's not the right time for it or i love it yeah. you know or whatever or let's move forward with this but it's just being heard right you know I, i'm sure you've been in meetings where someone's idea wasn't quite on the mark but there was an aspect of that that you were able to take that led to yeah. a better result but if yeah. they weren't heard they would never, that would never have been the result. So I think that's a really foundation. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I also think that, you know, just because people want to be heard doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't mean they're going to speak up. And I yeah. think that's the other part is you, you, you still have to maybe draw some of them out. They want to be heard, but they're just for, for whatever reason, they're not going to, to yeah. uh, speak up. You have to draw them out. Yeah. And that's the power of the question. Yeah. Right. And, and I think absolutely. And, and I like what you're saying about questions, because I think if everybody 
if, if, you, if you develop that norm in your organization and then every time there's a virtual meeting of any kind, the people go there knowing that they're likely to be asked a question and they'll be likely to be asked to ask questions, then it kind of puts more um, responsibility on collective responsibility to become to these uh, interactions prepared. Yeah, 100%. You know, and you got me thinking, and, and you know, um, I think like every podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and why this helps with sure. this idea mm-hmm. of mindful meetings. Um, you know, Q change, you know, our whole slogan is, is mindful meetings. So make meetings better. So, or make leaders better in meetings. So meetings are better. Right. And so the way we do that is through real time technology around meetings, whether it's in person mm-hmm. or virtual. And we do it inside Microsoft Teams, which is kind of the unique place because that's where everyone's doing work nowadays. And so right, right. Um, our solution reminds the leader to be present on whatever it is they're working with or on. If it's big picture thinking, whether it's succinct, indirect, or compassion or integrity, whatever it is they're working on as a leader, we actually nudge them before the meeting, literally three minutes before it, to work on that particular behavior. And in the middle of that meeting, we're focused on are they actually engaging in compassion or integrity or inclusion? And the reason why that's really important is that if we're focused on measuring inclusion, that has an impact across whatever you're working on, whether that is big picture thinking, whether that is tactical, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then after the meeting, we actually ask the leader, hey, did you perceive that you were compassionate in the meeting on a scale of one to five? And then we ask the team that they invited, hey, how compassionate was James in this meeting on a scale of one to five? which is really powerful because that's delivered back to you in real time in a leader team perception gap. And then it all culminates around this development side of, can I get some written feedback? I can choose to ask for that. And I can choose to go as, as if you were to give me feedback, it would say, what was the situation you saw James being compassionate or not compassionate? What were the actions that James were doing or behaviors in the meeting that you witnessed? And what was the impact it had on you? And then all Mm -hmm. of that is delivered back to you. The reason why that creates inclusive and uh, more engaged environments is that everyone's focused on the positive development of an individual that's the ripple across the river or across the the pond, as I said earlier. And what we found early on in our solution is that the leaders using a lot of, uh, you know, again, my background is a consumer psychologist. That's my Mm -hmm. PhD. And so, you know, using nudge theory to say the closer you are to the desired behavior that you're nudged, the more likely you are to do that behavior. So that three minutes does it. But we also know from a learning perspective that uh, when you create an experience, you're 75% more likely to retain what that experience was. Mm -hmm. And what the customers are saying from a beneficial standpoint is that the leaders love the nudge because it gets them present and mindful. And the team loves being part of their development. It gets them more engaged and part of the process. And together, that's a more inclusive environment. Yeah, no, I, I love that idea. And I love the, the nudge idea, because I think that's if there's one thing that's incredibly important nowadays is to nudge people, or maybe sometimes you need to nudge them a little more aggressively into, <laughs> in, in, into, being, pre, into being present, because we do live in this world where I, I, I always say this, uh, people tell me all the time, oh, I'm busy, John, I'm busier than I've ever been in my life. And I always say to, you, to them, are you though? Or are you just more, or are you just more distracted than you've ever been? Yeah. Do you just have more things to distract you? And therefore, I think the, the point that you raised about nudging somebody and getting them to be mindful and present, because I think being present is probably the biggest challenge that we yeah. have today is just having people be in the moment and be focused and be present because they're so used to being distracted. And, and I guess the other part is it's, I mean, once upon a time, it was considered like rude to be to not pay attention to the person you're talking to nowadays it's like people people excuse themselves oh yeah yeah oh sorry james i was just checking my message and yeah, you yeah. go and, and i expect you to go oh that's okay john that wasn't in the least bit rude yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, having, having spent 12 years teaching academia uh, in the mm-hmm. classroom i can tell you that rudeness factor drove me mad um mm-hmm. uh, and i would call students out all the time like what are you doing is that is that person mm-hmm. on the phone are you dying like why are you on the phone <laughs> Is, de- is death around the corner? Because you shouldn't, you're not that important. <laughs> Believe me, you're not yeah, that important, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but in a work environment, same thing. You know, I've had that conversation. I've been, I've been facilitating and I've, I've had to bite my tongue not to really embarrass someone because it's just so disrespectful to my time and energy yeah. to be up there, you know? And to, your, and, and to your point, like if your leader is modeling mindfulness and being engaged and being present 
and being focused and actually listening to people. I mean, again, that's a, that's, that's a model behavior that you want your organization to adopt. Yeah, and when you think about it, you know, I keep going back to this theme of whole systems, right? Mm -hmm. If the whole system is adopting this philosophy, the whole system will accelerate. And when you go through acceleration, the bottom line is that you're actually earning more revenue and profits for your organization. But you're doing it in a way that is not about destructive behavior, but about constructive behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I think that's a very that's a really important uh, important distinction for people to to understand. And it's and it's not like this stuff is is rocket science. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And a lot of it is is com is reintroducing people to common sense, the yeah. uncommon common sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny because. Um, we are, as a society, you know, I wrote an article of, about almost a year ago, and it was about don't blame the millennials uh, for their neediness. You know, <laughs> and my point was, is that we created in a society an ecosystem that fed that need of feedback, of commentary, of opinion. And if you think about what the microwave did back in the 50s and 60s, it fed that need to have those instant dinners in the micro. It changed our behaviors as a family yeah. or individual. And that's all that social media has done to the, to the millennials and Gen Zers is it's allowed them to have a voice and get a feedback straight away. It, allowed the, it allows yeah. them to take, I think it's on average, a person will take roughly 90 photos before they post it on Instagram, right? Someone who's trying to, like the mental exhaustion that goes into that is unbelievable. So. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and probably the amount of uh, yeah, the amount of mental brain power that's invested in deciding which picture to actually post on Instagram. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's probably more goes into that decision process <laughs> than goes into ones that we maybe consider a little more important. But uh, like strategy, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, but who am I to judge? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, listen, James, this has been great. Uh, so all of James's information will be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about QChange and what you do. Yeah. So, you know, as I said early on, as my, my short little plug is that QChange is really around making and creating mindful meetings using AI and technology. And so everything we do is in real time around the meetings. And so you can find more about us at QChange.com. That's the letter QChange.com. Uh, you can find more about me at uh, drjameskelly.com, the Scottish version, K-E-L-L-E-Y, mm -hmm. not the Irish version, um, <laughs> dot .com. Uh, and you can get my book also on my website for free. So I'm just giving it away as a, as a kindness gesture, if you will. Fantastic. Um, listen, this is a fascinating conversation. I would uh, absolutely encourage people to go check out QChange. Uh, everything you can do to make your your meetings, you know, more inclusive, more robust and all that is going to really serve you well, because as, as we said at the outset, um, a lot of companies are going to go with the hybrid model going forward. But I tend to think that that hybrid model is going to be heavily weighted towards virtual because people just aren't going to spend the money on, on travel and face to face meetings that they don't feel like they need to. Especially because we know, set the bar. We, we've created the bar now. I don't exactly. have to travel to see you to do sales. Oh, okay. Exactly. Exactly. All right, thanks. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, our CRM. See you all again real soon. Thank you.